last 25 years, James Mangold has proven himself to be one of the most versatile and consistent directors working today. He's done a Western, a biopic, a rom-com, multiple comic book movies, Best Picture nominees, and more. And he's got a new movie out, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. So today I'm going to stop and rank all 12 James Mangold films from the least best to the best. My name is Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of all the James Mangold films or at least all the James Mangold films that you've seen. My list is not the right list. It's just my list and I would love to see yours. As we go into this, I don't think that he has any total stinkers in here. He has some that I think are misfires or that didn't work as well or that don't resonate with me quite as much, but I don't think he has anything that's just a total fumble. So that's a point of reference as we go into this and let's get started. Coming in in last place, Identity, and of James Mangold's films, I feel this is the one for me that's the closest to a swing and a miss. It starts off as a fairly familiar whodunit where a group of strangers end up st stranded at a motel and then slowly they start being killed and you're trying to figure out who it is. And then it has one wild plot twist that kind of takes it in a totally different direction and causes you to dramatically reinterpret everything that you've seen before. And it's the kind of movie that if you buy into the twist, you probably have this movie much higher up on your list. And you're like, oh, that was a really cool little thriller with a wild twist that I haven't seen anything like that before. I saw the movie when it first came out in the theaters and then I, I rewatched it about a month back and I, I just can't buy into it. it it's, it's like interesting. It's, it's not a swing and a miss doing something generic or familiar. It tries to do something new and I go, I respect the ambition, but the, the basic concept of what's going on here it just didn't work for me. It's it's just kind of ones that just feels like too far of a stretch. It gets kind of too out there. So for me, this is my least favorite of his films. Number 11, Heavy. And this is a tough film to rank in this particular list. And I suspect that if I'd watched it at a different time in a different context, I, I might have responded more positively to it. But this is his first movie, and it's a mid-90s character exploration about loneliness. And all of his films tend to be thematically rich. There tends to be a lot of character work about broken, lonely people. And so in that regard, it, it fits nicely in with the rest of his films. But most of those other movies are very plot-based films with a lot of strong character work and themes as a and as an undercurrent. And this is just a character piece. It's looking at this very lonely man that's trying to connect with people and trying to maintain what, what he's gotten used to and the friendships that he's formed as he sees that his life is about to change forever. And when watching it in the middle of this list of films, it's kind of the one that made the, the least impact on me. It's the most subtle of the films. It's the one with the least flash to it. And for that reason, it, it probably didn't, I didn't just respond to it quite as well. Um, but it wasn't that it did anything particularly wrong. It's just that the other movies on this list perhaps touch on some of these same ideas and themes, just with packaging that is more on my wavelength and in my style. Kicking off our top 10, Kate and Leopold. And this is where you start to see just how diverse James Mangold's filmography really is because a, a lot of his films are kind of modern day Westerns or actual Westerns or dramas with kind of these or adventure films about themes of loneliness and kind of broken characters. And then in the middle of it, <laughs> the beginning of his career, then you also have a time travel rom-com starring Meg Ryan at kind of the peak of her fame and Hugh Jackman right on his rise to the A-list. And it's very much a rom-com of 
the early zeros with the type of fish out of water comedy to opposites that are kind of exactly what they're looking for. that complete each other, all of the beats that you want. Uh, it's, you know, it, the time travel elements kind of make it pop a little bit because it's time travel in a genre that's doesn't normally have time travel as the thing that pulls the two characters together and a, a fun to, uh, I don't know if a fun detail, but watching this movie, a couple of days after watching Dial of Destiny, you start to realize that James Mankell has kind of a specific idea about time travel, about just kind of these portals in the sky. You wouldn't think that that would be like a recurring theme of his perspective, of how that would appear in multiple films of his. But there it is. But, um, you know, if I'm looking for a rom-com, I, I don't imagine this is going to be the one that I'm going to rush to. I like the novelty of seeing this Hugh Jackman so early in his career as a star being just as good as he is now and that he he, just, he always had it. He's always had that charisma and that gravitas and can, can pull it off. And this is a movie where like he's playing against Meg Ryan in her genre, right? Like right as, you know, she's peaking or at the peak of her in this genre. And he's right there with her, even though this is only a year after he did X-Men. But... That's kind of what I remember it for, like the two leads, time travel, the specific details of anything in between, in the middle, specific scenes, specific gags. N none of that really popped out for me. Number nine, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. It's great to see Harrison Ford in the fedora again. He's just as good playing the character as he's ever been. And because of the nature of the story here, he has to carry kind of more of the like emotional weight than he's ever had to carry in this role. Uh, I wouldn't say that in just terms of just performance in general, that it's the best performance that he's given in the role because he was just so legendary back in the 80s. But he has to do more dramatic heavy lifting. He has to go places emotionally that he hasn't had to go before. And it just adds layers to the character that weren't there. So there's a lot of things like that that are nice to see and getting one more adventure of him in his prime, even if it has to do wonky de-aging to make it happen. It's nice to see Indy during World War II, even if it is essentially a glorified cartoon that we're watching. It's nice to see. And if you're going to do a movie about an aging, broken Indiana Jones trying to rediscover his value, his worth and his passion again, I, I mean, I guess this is about of, as good of a movie about that as you can make. I just don't know that you should make that movie. Not every character is meant to be deconstructed and explored like that. And in the case of Indiana Jones, the fantasy is of this Guy in his prime that's intelligent, good looking, man of action, battling Nazis, always in over his head. But because of his resourcefulness, he's just always barely able to squeak by and survive. And that fantasy's broken when all of a sudden it's an 80 year old man playing a 70 year old man who falls asleep drinking in front of the TV and is the cranky old man knocking on his neighbor's doors, telling him to turn down that racket and it being talked down to by everyone. That's not the fantasy and the escapism that I go to these movies for. So there's there's things in it that worked and they were emotional and sequences that I enjoyed. It was nice to see him again. With 30 plus years to reflect now on the end where the franchise might have otherwise ended, I'm thinking maybe it would have been best to leave him going off into the sunset back in 1989. Number eight, The Wolverine. And this is a movie that I've always kind of enjoyed, but never as much as I feel like I should. It's a movie about Wolverine, a character that I enjoy, played by a very committed Hugh Jackman from a director that I think is great where he goes to Japan and battles ninjas and samurai and a bunch of other cool stuff. If you just look, describe it that way, this feels like a movie that I should be raving about. But for whatever reason, something in the execution about this film has just always been a little bit off, a little bit flat. And for a long time, I, I just kind of used the end of the film as kind of almost an excuse like, oh, you know, it's really great until the third act where it kind of, 
unravels because it gets too cartoonish. But especially rewatching it, I, I don't even think that's fair I, or entirely accurate. That's being a little bit too kind to the first part of the movie where I think, I don't know, it just feels like nothing is quite as good as it should be. All of the, the new characters, allies, villains, side characters, whoever they are, all of them are kind of forgettable for me in this movie. None of them really stand out as anything particularly interesting or compelling on kind of any level. And then even the specific plot points, the the big general idea when it's set up in the first 20 minutes uh, about this person that Logan met during World War II and Logan's own desire for death and this other man's desire for immortality and there's some interesting ideas in the setup and then kind of everything in the middle isn't particularly memorable. I don't think it's bad. It's not something I'm like, ah, oh, man, they went off the rails besides maybe the cartoonish silver samurai in the third act. But it's just never quite as good as it should be. It's never pops. It never has that spark that something was just just kind of a little bit wrong throughout kind of the whole thing. Broad picture. Excellent. Great idea. Broad picture. But in the specifics, it doesn't fully deliver what you'd expect it to be. Next up, Night and Day. And this is an enjoyable enough Tom Cruise vehicle that's an action rom-com. But for me, it's kind of in a bit in that same category as the Wolverine in that it's a movie that's never quite as, as good and fulfilling as I think it should be. Because Tom Cruise, of course, is wildly entertaining. This is a fun genre that I enjoy, a director that I think is great. Uh, I'm not like a gigantic Cameron Diaz fan, but I got nothing against Cameron Diaz, so hook her up with Tom Cruise. There's plenty of fun to be had with that. And I, I watched it when it first came out, with, uh, 13 years ago now, however long ago that was, and I was like, oh, that was enjoyable enough, but never like felt the need to re-explore it, and then watched it few weeks back and I went, oh, that was fun. I, I enjoyed that. I, I liked that a little bit more than I remember. I don't know when I would ever rewatch that, but that was, I guess, more enjoyable than I remember uh, it, it, it being. And I think maybe some of it is that the way that it kind of treats the outlandish nature of the setup with Tom Cruise being this spy and everything like that is maybe a little bit too outlandish without enough anchors and reality kind of connecting us to normal world. So I think maybe some of it's that. Um, but I, I'm not even sure. Like, once again, it's kind of one of those ones where it's fun. It's enjoyable. I like it. It's my kind of film. It has all the ingredients, but something just a little bit off in the ex execution. So it's never as great as it should be in light of all of the parts. Number six, Girl Interrupted. And this is a movie I really wasn't sure what to expect Going into it, no idea where it was going to land on this ranking. It's a film that I've been aware of since it came out 24 years ago that uh, became this movie that ended up being kind of a launching pad for a bunch of top talent for the really kind of the next 20 years. We got Angelina Jolie being one of her big breakout roles being in this, but I'd never seen it until last night and I found myself I don't know, connecting with the characters a lot more than I was expecting and being a lot more invested in it than I, I thought that I would be. If you don't know the basic setup here, essentially it's about a girl in the late 60s who is institutionalized for a year after attempting suicide. And it's it's all about kind of the friendships she makes and the how people with mental illness are treated in kind of different facets, whether institutionalized, how family treats them, how the bad behavior that comes from mental illness can be treated just as someone choosing to engage in bad behavior. And the, the tension there of what is, how much do you blame the person when it's the illness? Um, likewise, the, the, the tricky distinction between what is just youthful indiscretion and what is mental illness? There's like a lot of just like complicated issues being addressed. And what it does really well is it takes a group of characters that are, are inherently very difficult. But because the, the actresses are so good, 
Some of that, you know, bringing in Winona Ryder, who's kind of the the big kind of established actress of the young people, and then Whoopi Goldberg as kind of the the nurse looking over them. And then they, I think, I don't know, they got lucky or whatever, but they they cast like all of these people that were up and comers. So you know, like Angelina Jolie and Brittany Murphy and, and many others that it was just like a really good cast that were able to portray very difficult people. And Elizabeth Moss is in here. Like we're watching. I was like, wait, wasn't she like a teenager when they shot this? And she was, she was like 17 when they made the movie. And I was like, that, there you go. And just like discovered so much top level talent for people that like, that were not in that category at the time this movie was being made, but that they're able to, to have the humanity and the charm even with people that can be very abrasive, in particular with Angelina Jolie's character, she is written to be a very abrasive, at times cruel person, but you still have a humanity in there because of Angelina Jolie, what she brings to the character. And so yeah, a movie that... Um, I don't know. I, I found it a lot more interesting than I than I was expecting to. Much more invested in kind of everything taking place. Number five, Walk the Line. And as just a little bit of a point of reference, I'm not like a Johnny Cash guy. I've never gone through a Johnny Cash phase. Like, you know, I, and that's in no way like a hater or anything like that. I've just never been specifically into his particular music or songs. And the song of his that I probably enjoyed the most is Hurt. And that's because I like Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> and so him covering Nine Inch Nails, well, it's their song, not his song. But like I said, not a hater, just I'm not invested in Johnny Cash, uh, particularly as as a musician. I don't know his story outside of having just watched this movie for the first time a few days back. And what makes this movie so compelling is that it's a, a very challenging biopic because essentially you're watching characters behave badly and the central romance the movie is built around a romance between two people and their relationship their friendship and romance building over years while they're married to other people and while they're making bad choices and it doesn't really do too much to try and soften that it doesn't try to excuse that it, it is it is romanticizing what they're doing in a sense, but it's not excusing what they're doing. It puts Johnny Cash in a very negative light for the vast majority of the runtime of the film. And sometimes there's something very refreshing about that. When a movie takes someone that is this interesting character of pop culture from the last 70 years and just kind of goes all right, this is who he was. And th these are the, the choices that he made. And there's pieces to that. Like, as you're like, watch as they, they've known each other a long time and go through other marriage, all sorts of other stuff in the process of finally getting together. That's really interesting. I don't know that I can approve of it in a lot of ways. And the movie, since they ended up staying together for 35 years, clearly it was meant to be. But the way it went about, <laughs> there's all sorts of not so great things about it. And that's kind of what the movie is, is almost airing their dirty laundry while trying to say, like, it doesn't mean that they were devoid of good. Doesn't mean they shouldn't have been together. There's something about that that's interesting while being challenging at the same time. Like, you can't, like, you're not really rooting for them. I'm not even rooting for them to get together. But that is what, in another sense, what I am moving towards. Like, when is, when's it going to happen? Huh. It's a complicated set of emotions and feelings that you had watching this one. Other one is that it doesn't even, as much as it does introduce some of the trauma from his childhood, with his, of course, with his brother and his disapproving father, it, it introduces those things that kind of have that, that brokenness to him. But it doesn't in a lot of ways even draw the connection of how that led to his own choices that he made that hurt people around him dearly and the selfishness of his own ways uh, of how he, he treated his first wife so overtly in bad ways. Um, so it's 
fascinating watch for that reason. Uh, another one where kind of like Girl Interrupted, that so much of what makes it work is you've got just these top talents. And in the case of like a, a Reese Witherspoon, Oscar winning performance, like this is like a career high for her. And then Joaquin Phoenix, of course, being one of the top actors of the last 25 years consistently. And because of that, they can just find something in it, playing very broken people, making bad choices and still find the humanity and the sympathy that we can have for them in it. Then we have 310 to Yuma, and this is easily one of the best Westerns of the 21st century. And so much of that boils down to you have two powerhouse actors of the last 25 years playing against each other with a top caliber director that can deliver both the exciting, thrilling, modern Western action, as well as finding all kind of the deep emotion in each of the little scenes that take place, all the little dialogue between these characters, you get it. And it just makes for an exciting Western, but also a compelling character study. And you have Russell Crowe just kind of chewing up every scene as this confident, manipulative outlaw that's having fun toying with the people that have taken him captive. And at the same time, you have Bale playing this man who has been utterly humiliated by life. And he's desperately trying to save his family. And it's not that he doesn't have something to offer the world. And it's not that he doesn't have heroics. It's just that life has dealt him this terrible hand. And in this last ditch effort to make money, decides to take this outlaw to the 310 to Yuma. And the whole movie, you just see Crow talking down to him, making fun of him, doubting him, trying to get him to question himself. But the conviction of this broken man to do the right thing when no one else will is even able to like soften this hardened outlaw and making for like a really profound kind of final moments to the, the film. So just a really good Western that has all the things that you want from a Western, the action, but also a lot of emotion to it too, and just phenomenal performances. And then even like the side characters, Ben Foster, they're, they're all great. It's just really well done. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to join me down below in the comment section, share your ranking of the James Mangold films that you've seen. Also, if you like this type of content, I've done a ton of other director rankings. James Gunn, Steven Spielberg, Christopher Nolan, David Fincher, M. Night Shyamalan, and so many more. You can check out a list somewhere around here or a playlist somewhere around here. Uh, if you like this video, there's definitely another video that you'll like. And third, Copland. And this is a movie that I saw in the theater when it first came out 25 years ago. I went to go see it because I was and still am, a massive Sylvester Stallone film, uh, fan. And this is a film where he very much plays against type. Now he's still playing a police officer, but instead of being the action hero, both his character and his physique are designed to be of this lonely, broken man that has never lived up to his potential. So very famously, infamously, he gained 40 pounds of fat for this role, just drinking ice cream for months straight to just put on weight and plays essentially the sheriff of this town just outside of New York City where only police officers live. And so he's the cop of Copland. And because of a injury during his childhood where he was saving someone, was never able to be a New York City cop, and never got to follow that dream to do real police work. And now it's just in a city where he doesn't really do anything until through the plot of the film discovers corruption where he's at and he's challenged. And if you look at the cast for the film, phenomenal cast. Everyone here is top tier. Everyone is excellent. And I love stories about people kind of discovering their long buried potential, the potential they always thought they had, but never got to live up to. And that's, that's what this story is about a guy that has just given up on being anything. And then he's given his chance to try and do the right thing. 
and it's challenging him in, in all the ways that he didn't doesn't want to be challenged. And that's what com- makes it compelling and interesting and satisfying as you kind of move into the end of the film. And sl- it's a, definitely a slow burn. It's not a big action film. And slowly building the tension until it gets to this big slam bang payoff uh, as the, the plot kind of kind of plays out. Our runner up, Logan, one of the most highly praised comic book movies of all time and an uncompromising superhero movie actually made for grownups. Right out of the gate, it makes it clear this movie's not trying to play to the broadest possible audience. It's not looking to have a PG-13 rating. It's a movie that, that says we're making a movie that not just because it has blood, bad language, and boobs is it rated R, but it's also a movie just made to resonate with adults on a thematic level. It's a movie about a man who thus far has been immortal and is suddenly facing death of himself and people around him. And therefore, it's it's a movie that's interesting. Because that's the thing that has always loomed around this character. Death. But he hasn't faced it himself. And he's at a point in time in life where he doesn't have a reason to go on anymore. Everything is is in the past. There's He's only surviving to ca- take care of a few people. And telling a story that gives him a reason to go just a little bit longer to live just a little bit more and be that hero one more time. There's something about that that's that's just deeply emotionally resonant because of the nature of the character. You can do things with him that you, you can't do with others. Because Hugh Jackman and Patrick Stewart had been playing their respective roles nearly 20 years at the point in time that this movie came out, There's just such a rich history there that this movie can borrow from, that you you know that they care about each other. You know they've been through so much life together. And Logan, this just hardened, abrasive man, there's one person that he'd put up with the stuff that Professor X says and does in this film, and it's Professor X. And the reason we can do that, that can happen, is because of all this history that we have and the concern that we have for them. These are uh, career best performances in these roles for each of them. Just as a Wolverine film, it's great to finally get this rage berserker version of Logan, both when he goes full out berserker at the end of the film, but also just when he gets mad at the guys at the beginning of the movie, too, where he can just tear people up. R-rated fashion without any concern of getting an R rating. They designed it to be R-rated. And I wonder if even that's part of the problem with the Wolverine is that they couldn't quite decide, are we rated R or are we PG-13? And they have z it. And because of that, it, it doesn't, it's not made broadly accessible enough to be PG-13 in the most satisfying way. And it doesn't commit to being serious enough. This movie commits to being a comic book movie for adults with adult themes and adult ideas. And it does that really well. And that's what makes it great. It's not made for everyone. It's made for a specific group of people. And it does that really well. But coming in at number one, Ford vs. Ferrari. I, I love this movie. This is a director that's put out a bunch of great films that I love and rewatching through all of them. The one that I was like, man, that was just awesome. And it's so rewatchable and it's so where it works on so many different levels, emotionally, entertainment, drama, tragedy, victory. The one that came out on top for me, Ford vs. Ferrari. This is just like a classic, great underdog story, but while doing it in kind of a different way. It's a film about a group of dudes trying to do something awesome, trying to achieve greatness, but having very different personalities, having very different perspectives on what it takes to do that. And having all of this tension within the Ford organization, all these different personalities, that there's people that are portrayed as the villain of the story, but in another sense, they're not really doing anything villainous. They serve an important role for Ford in this organization. And the only reason that 
Ford could come out on top and look as good and accomplish all of this is because all of them have their unique skill sets and their own flaws. All of this weird mesh, it shouldn't have worked, but it was the perfect storm that delivered something incredible uh, at the exact same time. And that's what makes it compelling. They shouldn't have won. They shouldn't have had success. And yet they found success in it. And what it, I think it does so well is that it has all of this natural conflict built into it that feels organic. It doesn't feel like melodrama. It doesn't pull any emotional punches without feeling forced at the same time. It delivers all these victories, but also with like not in the most obvious ways at times. And then when you have victories, it finds ways to sneak tragedy into it. And the craziest bit about all of it is that it's almost all true. <laughs> like you watch the movie and you go, that was wild. That's what happened here? And you look it up and it's a pretty accurate re representation of this bizarre scenario that took place of this weird driver guy that didn't get along with people that was incredibly talented had incredible victories, but also got cheated at the same time. It's just a great story told with excellence and you're just bringing in top tier actors to tell the story. And, you know, of course, Christian Bale is just one of these transformative actors just kind of disappears into characters and play him weird and different. And you just see the character. You don't see Christian Bale. Damon's always great, so I, I love this movie. It's so satisfying on such a broad emotion level. So it comes in at number one. Remember, if you enjoyed this video, I've got more like it. You can check out my other director rankings right over there. Christopher Nolan, Spielberg, David Fincher, and so many more. Thank you so much for watching, and keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.